Greetings, students. I have prepared a lecture for you on the topic of sacred geometry. And you might wonder what sacred geometry has to do with tuning forks or sound healing. And if you have wondered that, this course, this class, will really show you why and how uh, it's become such an important topic for me and why I have developed some tuning forks based on sacred geometry. So right here I have um, the Fibonacci pair of tuning forks and this is 89 hertz and 144 hertz and together they create a binaural beat of phi. Well, what's phi? So we're going to go into that in detail and at some point along the way I'm going to take a little break from teaching you um, heady stuff about sacred geometry and I'm going to show you how you can use these tuning forks and what exactly it is that they are doing in your body. It helps to have a background sense. You can apply that intelligence and awareness and information into your practice and whatever it is that you do. So if you are a sound healer, um, this will be useful for you. But I find with sacred geometry, it really encompasses all of the disciplines in some way or another. So sound healers, if you have a partner who is a carpenter, um, they might be interested in this as well. I have kind of a funny story around sacred geometry and my earliest exposure to it. I live here in Vermont where there's a school called Yestermorrow and they teach you how to do things like build tree houses and carpentry for women and straw bale construction, all that good stuff. And my husband is a builder and he got on their mailing list and one day we received a catalog in the mail of their upcoming courses and I sat down and I flipped through it and I actually found a class that I want to take. Now I'm not a hands-on builder kind of gal. Now, I got my husband to take care of that. In fact, at our home, we have a bookcase and we have all of his bookcases, uh, all his books on building and carpentry and all that sort of thing. And then all of my books on science and healing and human potential. And I never read his books and he never read my books. And our interests seemed very separate. And so later that day, he said to me, hey, I was looking through the Yestermorrow catalog and I found a couple classes that I want to take. And I said, oh, wow, I found a class I wanted to take too. And I said, what one do you want to take? He said, um, hands on sacred geometry. And I was like, oh my God, I want to take that one too. And so we went together and we took this weekend class where we learned all about sacred geometry. We watched a slideshow, we saw lots of images of it in architecture and in art and in nature and the human body. And we had hands-on exercises where we built the platonic solids, which you'll learn about here, out of raisins and toothpicks. <laughs> and then we used a uh, I can't think of what it's called, compass and uh, pencil and scissors and we cut out the shapes and we folded them and we glued them together. And it was a wonderful, wonderful workshop. And it was so interesting because on the way home on the second day after, we've just been really immersed in order and harmony and beauty and nature and things that were <clears throat> visually pleasing. I was really aware of the very bad architecture decisions that had been made and a lot of the houses that we drove by. I was able to see more readily what was beautiful, what was proportionate, and what was wildly disproportionate. You know, we don't learn about sacred geometry in school. We don't learn about so many of these principles that I'm going to share with you. Um, another experience that I had with this that was also very transformative was a book called A Beginner's Guide to Creating the Universe. And truly one of the most profound books I've ever read. Um, and I'm gonna share some snippets of that with you. I find that learning about and understanding and even creating, doing these exercises with like building the platonic solids with toothpicks and raisins, which I went home and did with my kids. And I think it was really good for my kids at that time. They were probably nine and 12 to be exposed to this. And it made me feel like it was so important to teach our children about these principles so that they, 
this information will inform the built environment going forward with more beauty and more order and harmony. And we all know when we're in structures that are harmonically balanced in proportion, whether it's our own body that's in harmony, <laughs> That structure makes a big difference. But if we go into something like the old world cathedrals or um, buildings that were clearly built using these principles, it elevates our own human spirit. It expands us into our greater potential than if we're in something like a trailer, which I lived in a single wide trailer for a while. <laughs> I can tell you that the harmonics of that proportion are really not um, optimum for supporting our human potential. So there's a lot to learn here. So I just invite you to settle in, bowl of popcorn and get comfy. And I'm gonna lead us through this slideshow. Okay, so enjoy. Okay, so let's begin. All right, sacred geometry, the blueprint of creation. Geometry, I don't want to just kind of read the slides, but there is a lot of information on the slides and everyone will be able to kind of come back to these and read them. You know, I created this sort of as a reference material. But geometry is found everywhere in things seen and unseen. It's in music. It's even in the structure of the sounds that you're hearing from my voice. Um, there is a pattern in the heavens where those who want to can see it and establish in their own minds. And I think this is a really important quote because what I found was as I exposed myself to this information, I was able to establish it in my mind. I felt that understanding it, and for whatever reason, especially the platonic solids, created a kind of structure and boundary and form in me that wasn't previously present. It, it provided a scaffolding, a framework, something solid so that I didn't feel so much like an amorphous bag of water, <laughs> but, but a being that actually had a blueprint, a structured blueprint that was the same structure that was blueprinting everything in nature. It's a very important part of our being to connect with. It's not the source of energy, but an agent for the human mind to witness the invisible in action. So it, it is a, it's a pattern. Geometry is a pattern, but not necessarily a source of energy. Energy informs these patterns. It's present in all things seen and unseen. So geometry existed before the creation. The blueprint of our beings or the blueprint that anything unfolds on is in existence before that matter unfolds. So all of nature is geometric. To engage with geometry is to engage with the mind of source and to be reminded of the interconnection of everything, right? I actually made uh, this an independent study in my master's degree in integrative education. And I was looking at things that connect the disciplines. As you go into higher education, everything becomes separate. Uh, we see this in medicine. We see this in many, many places where um, wheelhouses, everybody's in their own wheelhouse, but we're not looking at how these wheelhouses connect and join up. And so sacred geometry is a wonderful area of study. If you're interested in, in healing the lack of awareness around life's interconnectedness, we've been very conditioned to see things as separately. And this is a way to see the underlying patterns and the connectivity. It's the blueprint of the natural world and the basis of all form. It's an ancient science. This has been around for a long, long time and very, very ancient buildings that are informed by the principles of sacred geometry. So it explains the patterns that create and unify. Um, it reveals the precise way that the energy of the universe organizes itself. So if you think about that, if we're building something and we create it, 
in the same precise way that nature creates things. And that is creating a built environment that is in harmony with nature. So on every scale, every natural pattern of growth or movement conforms inevitably to one or more geometric shape. It's not all random and chaotic. There's an underlying pattern that matter forms on. Uh, sorry, this one's a little hard to see. What makes it sacred? So th that word is, it's a little tricky, right? It, it falls into that category of uh, esoteric or maybe even pseudoscience in some people's mind. I'm certainly trending in the direction of religion and not science. In fact, when I was contemplating wanting to help to teach this in schools to kids, I contemplated calling it classic geometry instead of sacred geometry, just to remove that preconception that could get in the way. Um, it means holy, spiritual, and unchanged since the beginning of time. The patterns of sacred geometry emerged within numerous ancient cultures all around the globe. So this is everywhere, like every culture uh, has tuned into on some level and found a way to express these patterns of nature in art, architecture, and so on. Uh, the lack of awareness of these underlying connective orderly patterns creates a cosmology or a universal perception of separation. Right? This is a theme we're going to come back to again and again. You know, I figured out when I was 18, I was like, okay, the biggest problem going on here is this illusion of separation. It's what engenders fear and greed and, um, you know, all, all kinds of not good things in humanity. And I realized that if we could just solve that problem and get people to really truly wake up to unity consciousness, not just as a concept, but as a visceral knowing that we would solve a lot of other problems in the process. And this is a very important component in that vision. You know, I'm an idealist. <laughs> I vision humanity waking up and recognizing the preciousness of this place and this experience. The awareness of these patterns allows for perceiving that everything is connected. And these are just some examples around the globe. We see the flower of life. We see the flower of life everywhere, uh, all over the world. And that's because it is a fundamental expression of life itself. So the education of the soul, this is, you know, it's an interesting term. Uh, I was told once by somebody who gave me a hard time on my earliest YouTube videos, uh, who I ended up getting into dialogue with and actually succeeding in changing his mind. But he was a professor at a university and he actually said to me that I, that I didn't have a soul. He's like, you don't have a soul. <laughs> like maybe you don't have a soul but i definitely have a soul and how can we have, all have a perception of this thing called the soul and then science comes along and tells us it doesn't exist like that's just silly i've come to see our electrical system as our soul our plasma body our light body and uh, the part of us that when we're alive and your lights are on is there and when you die that light goes out well, that light can't die, though it is, uh, it is eternal and indivisible, ultimately. And so the ancients believed that the experience of sacred geometry was essential to the education of the soul. They knew that these patterns and codes were symbolic of our own inner realm and the subtle structure of awareness. Right? This is really important. This is what I was talking about when I did that hands-on sacred geometry workshop. It, it brought to light uh, the symbols of my inner realm, you know, <laughs> and, and then that lived in me. Uh, and if we're not exposed to that, then, then we're missing something very critical. So patterns, this is the essence of sacred geometry is the patterns. And you see how the one becomes the two, um, becomes four, turns into the flower of life. Um, you know, all, all of these different things that we see here are representative of how life forms and unfolds. 
Uh, they reveal the proportion, balance, and harmony inherent in the construction of the universe. Okay? The universe, the cosmos, is harmonious. It is orderly. It is beautiful. And humans have gone out of tune with this. There's not that anything is fundamentally wrong with us because our factory settings are harmony. They just are. And there is a part of our collective being that is divine and is in divine harmony with all of creation. And I believe that it's possible to restore humanity to harmony. Okay, I mean, I really, really believe that. And it's certainly a big job, but if you've been called to be a tuner, you're here to help with that. <clears throat> so there are, these are the different fundamentals of sacred geometry, and we're going to kind of touch on each one of these. Um, fractals, vesica pisces, and the seed, flower, tree, and fruit of life. Metatron's cube, platonic solids, I'm going to talk about this a bunch. Uh, the torus. Merkaba, vector equilibrium, Fibonacci sequence, phi, and spirals. Well, spirals are something we don't learn about at all. So fractals are very cool, and this is a good concept to understand. Now, basically, the fractals concept is that um, the same patterns repeat themselves in nature at every level of scale. So from the micro to the macro, we see life expressing itself <clears throat> in these same patterns throughout nature. Um, you know, one of the things like the branching of trees, the branching of blood vessels, the branching of, of river systems, water systems. Um, fractal means fraction of the all, indicating that each piece is a part of the whole. It's the basic idea of a hologram and this whole idea, uh, according to Dan Winter, so if you guys aren't familiar with Dan Winter, he's brilliant, he's a little hard to understand sometimes because he is so brilliant. I try to kind of break things down into more simple, digestible stuff than Dan does. But if you're heady, um, I would definitely check out his work. So the universe at large is just a super hologram. There's more and more evidence that you know, that's what it is. It's all just light in patterns. And the fractals of electromagnetic energy interconnect everything with everything within the universe and are the basic building blocks of this hologram. The fractal repetitive, repetitive, <laughs> repetitive structures of electromagnetic energy weave a giant cobweb through the universe. A cobweb of connectivity. So the story of creation in sacred geometry is based on the flower of life pattern. It starts with unity with the one and builds a sphere at a time from the first sphere to the vesica Pisces, to the seed, the flower, the tree and the fruit of life. So it's just one becoming two becoming, you know, more. <laughs> everything comes from the one and everything returns to the one. So each stage of this pattern holds the blueprint for the geometrically patterned way that energy comes forth into the matter, right? There's got to be patterns that matter it's forming on. And this is also pa for pattern is more masculine, ma, mother, mass, matter. And so you have the combination, ma and pa, the masculine and feminine, the pattern and the matter. So this is uh, the that journey, right? From one, two, three, four, five, six, and look, it turn. Look what it turns into. Look what it turns into. Um, very fascinating. Metatron's cube is present within the flower of life. Now, and th there's certain things I'll go a little deeper on, and there's certain things I'm just going to touch on. So if you find something like Metatron's cube very intriguing. I invite you to go off on your own research and you know rabbit hole however however you like. 
As the sacred geometry story of creation continues, Metatron's cube emerges from the connection of the centers of each of the 13 spheres and circles in the fruit of life, right? 13, interesting number, the 13 lunar months in a year. Uh, Metatron's cube also holds the potential to generate all the geometry of our world. So think about that, how the one, two, three, right? All of that coming up to 13, all of a sudden you've got everything, right? everything. And where did the one come from? It came from the none. <laughs> That's the amazing part of creation, right? That anything that the one even comes into being and then divides itself into the many. <clears throat> so as you can see, the outlines for the five platonic solids, um, which are down here, and we'll go into those, I think, in the next slide. Um, but all of these solids are contained within Metatron's cube. Okay, so the, um, the platonic solids are named after Plato on account of his extensive exploration of them. However, there is evidence of recognition of these shapes long before Plato. Uh, in fact, they, they just recently found carved ones um, from like Neolithic times, the perfect, um, I, I should get a picture of this because it was really surprising to see they've found in Scotland or something uh, carved platonic solids definitely from the time before Plato. Uh, they are also called the dice of the gods because of their perfection and symmetry. So within each shape, all faces, edges, and vertices are the same, and they all fit inside a sphere with all vertices touching the sphere. So at the atomic level, these shapes are the building blocks of all our physical world. The atoms of the elements of the periodic table are structurally shaped according to the nesting of these five platonic solids. Right? So these are the, the patterns that underlay all of the chemistry, all of the building blocks of life. And so the tetrahedron is four-sided and it is connected to the element of fire. The octahedron is eight-sided and it is connected to the element of air. The hexahedron or cube is six-sided and connected to the element of earth. The icosahedron is 20-sided and that relates to water. And the dodecahedron, which I actually have one here, <laughs> I got my own little dodecahedron, relates to ether. And ether is one of my um, favorite things to talk about and to educate people on. And what's really interesting is that the, the Dodecahedron allegedly in the mystery schools was sort of hidden from the common people because they felt it was such a powerful shape that it shouldn't it shouldn't be misused. And you know it's interesting because when you look at it, right, what is it made up of but pentagrams? Um, and you know what what is the one of the most powerful buildings on the planet uh, is actually shaped like this and is harnessed quite a lot of um, matter <laughs> when you think about it and resources um, through perhaps the utilization of that shape and um, you know something pretty intentional I would say uh, there's there's magic in understanding um, life at this level so the physical world is built out of the atoms of these elements and the physical manifestation at all scales from micro to macro expresses according to these structural ratios. So the platonic solids arrange themselves in fractal patterns, weaving a matrix in space, interconnecting atoms with the stars. The scales of the platonic solid shapes are different, but the ratios between them are still the same. And that's the hermetic principle of as above, so below. So that very much encompasses the concept of a fractal, as above, so below. The torus, okay, this is another one of my favorite shapes. <laughs> and I have one of these too. There we go. This is a torus. And it looks a lot like, like that one right there. Um, so the torus is a donut-shaped vortex or a sphere with a spiraling channel through the center. It is the primary shape pattern that emerges out of the sacred geometry genesis. 
and everything moves through this form in one way or another. Did you learn about this in school? I didn't. So it, the, the torus or primary pattern, primary pattern is an energy dynamic that looks like a donut. It's a continuous surface with a hole in it. The energy goes in one end, circulates through the center and exits out the other side. You can see it everywhere in atoms, cells, seeds, flowers, trees, animals, humans, hurricanes, planets, suns, galaxies, and even the cosmos as a whole. Remember a few years ago, there was a, you know, science by press release saying that, that the universe was donut shaped. And of course that generated a lot of silly memes. Um, so we are traveling in a boundless sea of infinite torus flow. But it isn't really boundless because it is bounded. It's bounded and yet it is infinite at the same time. It's sort of one of the interesting paradox of life is the universe um, an open system or a closed system. And it's actually an open system within a closed system, which is kind of mind boggling. <laughs> so these are just examples of Taurus, the human energy field, right? You've <clears throat> seen me talk about that a lot. It's a circulating and how it circulates. And I find that the human energy field circulates bi-directionally, that there's current flowing into and out of both ends of this. It isn't just one direction, but there's a bi-directional flow. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the Merkaba. So the mer means light. This is an Egyptian uh, terminology, as I understand it. Ka means spirit, and ba means body. So the Merkaba is composed of two intersecting and counter-rotating tetrahedrons that, can, that create a 3D energy field. The Merkaba relates to the separation from unity into the polarity of yin and yang that characterizes all manifestation, right? So this is the one draw, dividing into the two and then the spiraling relationship between these energies, so the masculine and feminine, uh, positive and negative, north and south, and how the dynamic interplay of this dielectric dance is what gives rise to everything else. So the Merkaba is said to be within the heart center of the human field, a source of toroidal fields, and a vehicle that assists in connecting with different states of consciousness. Maybe some of you have done Merkaba activations. <clears throat> um, this is an interesting shape, and I think just kind of looking at it, it has a feeling of, of stability, right? There's something very stable about this. It's also a pattern when you look at it from the top down that you see in quilting or you see in art and architecture the vector equilibrium is known to be the most primary geometric energy array in the cosmos it is the only shape in which all vectors from center to vertice and edges are equal it creates the perfect conditions for movement of energy to come into complete equilibrium Right? So just looking at that shape has a, a containing, sort of balancing, stabilizing effect on the psyche. Let's take a moment to just sit with an awareness of that. I mean, would that be cool to build with, with toothpicks and raisins? <laughs> what would that be like? Uh, the more familiar you become with the shapes, structures, patterns, and systems of sacred geometry, the more you see the way they all relate and connect and emerge from and into each other. Okay, <clears throat> so now we're going to come to the Fibonacci sequence. And the Fibonacci sequence is obviously, if you guys are familiar with my work, something that I've been intrigued with for a while and something that I've actually created uh, some sets of tuning forks around. So it is a numerical sequence that continually generates the phi ratio. So a lot of us learn about pi 3.14 da 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 da, but we don't learn about phi. Uh, 1.614, so it's also known as the golden mean or the golden ratio. 
And the sequence is formed by adding the previous two numbers in the sequence to get the next number. So it goes 0, 1, 1, 2, 5, 8, 13, 21, 35, and so on. And the phi ratio is generated by dividing a number in the sequence by the one before it. So if you divide 34 by 21, you get one, um, 1.614 no, around that. So every single one of these, when you divide them, the phi ratio appears, which is really pretty cool. So the Fibonacci sequence contains this way that nature unfolds in this beautiful geometric kind of way. It also gives rise to the golden rectangle. So business cards are actually in the shape of a golden rectangle. It tends to be the most visually pleasing to look at. And we can see this phi ratio in our human body. So the ratio of the forearm to the hands, the ear actually forms this golden um, rectangle, the phi spiral. So when we translate the sequence into shapes, spirals are formed. And it's like the sunflower, the pine cone, the unfurling fern, a galaxy, like this phi spiral and golden mean proportion shows up everywhere in the material world. So the spiral is something that we also don't really learn about. Um, I think that it's, it's such an important motion in nature because everything propagates and moves in spirals. So water, you know, the reasons why rivers don't run straight, they meander because water spirals as it moves. Uh, the heart pumps blood into our veins in a spiraling motion. Sound propagates spi spirally and spherically, right? So everything in nature really moves in this spiral form. And um, there's different kinds of spirals. There's like the phi spiral we just saw or the Archimedean spiral that's here in this image. Um, they have a calm eye, right? That corresponds to the zero at the beginning of the Fibonacci sequence. And without the eye, there would be no, there would be nothing, right? So everything has to arise from this calm center. And it exists within all living things, including self not as a concept you, you're still center is an actual part of the pattern and the dynamic process that is self and i found that that when we can spiral in a way that we are expanding we, that we're growing outward or we can spiral in a way where we're, we're like going in and going down I had a revelation once about how I was addicted to struggle and I was addicted to that feeling of the spiral kind of coming in and coming down and spiraling against it. And that's when I came up with this whole idea of flipping the spin, like just reverse the direction that that energy is flowing and move from contraction into expansion. And you can really do that with your own mind. So that's just something to play with. Um, they grow by self-accumulation and shrink by dissolution. Um, matter precipitates where positive and negative spiral rhythms synchronize. So they've actually found in galaxies that, there, that most of the galaxies might be spinning clockwise, for example, but then there's also an element that's spinning counterclockwise as well. So these energetic lines of force that the more dense substance of the world mother goddess or ma matter, right, mother, um, precipitates, descending from light, which is a plasma, to a gas, to a liquid, and finally solid expression. But this is all a consequence of all different layers and levels of light spiraling into form. Okay, so now we're going to go on a voyage from 1 to 10. We're going to look at the numbers that we use. Um, this might sound a little boring or like, why are we doing this? But Honestly, I, this information that I'm going to share with you uh, is really profound and, and it's really useful. I, I wouldn't take the time to lay all this out for you if it hadn't been so important in my own education, my own understanding of just life, the universe and everything, our human bodies, and especially health, right? And that's what I'm really into, like, how can we be vital? How can we be coherent? How can we be alive? And part of it is understanding the natural world that we're part of, uh, because our educational system 
kind of serves up to us like a cadaver of life. It's sort of like dry and juiceless, right? You think about geometry you learn in school. Like if I had learned sacred geometry in school, I would have gotten much better math grades. I would have been much more interested in math because there's magic and juice in this. Whereas, you know, algebra and geometry, they're kind of like dry toast, you know, <laughs> not really interesting. Um, but this is this is interesting and it's useful. Well, first and foremost, I really think that it's useful. So each number is seen as an uh, an archetype of nature. And um, I like this quote, the original 10 patents for designs found throughout the universe. So that's just a, um, a really good illustration of how important it is to understand the fundamentals and how we can build from there. So one, the number one is symbolized by the circle. And the circle is the shape from which all other shapes arise. Uh, it breathes into the void and gives rise to all the other numbers. Um, and you can see that if you multiply one, 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 one times, you know, all that, you end up with a really interesting number. And numbers are really interesting. You start playing with them. They can really kind of boggle the mind about the way that they all work. Uh, the area within the circumference which manifests between nothing the zero point inside and everything so there are infinite points around the circumference okay so this is a really important thing to understand because the circle is both a closed system in that it's finite but it's also an open system in that it's infinite you can divide up an infinite number of points within the circumference of the circle. So this is a really interesting paradox of bothism. And you guys know that I'm a bothist. Um, so, you know, is the universe a closed system or an open system? It's both. It's both. It's a it's an infinite system within a finite system, which is kind of interesting. So nothing exists without a center around which it revolves. When the center does not hold, the entire affair collapses. Right? When something is pointless, it has no center holding it together. And it's really important in any endeavor <clears throat> that we do that, that there's a point to it, that there has to be some kind of central point that things resolve, revolve around. The Ouroboros is a symbol representing the monad or one. Um, and we see this everywhere. The, the monad is on every continent, the Ouroboros. It's about the eternal unity of all things and the cycle of endless cycles repeating themselves. So universe, one turn or one song. Okay, so then we're gonna come into two, the dyad and what we see here is the, the Vesica Pisces which is sort of the cosmic womb of creation. So the one divides into two and then uh, the cosmic womb. And so the rest of the numbers and their respective shapes, because every number has a shape, emerge from this. So the principle of the dyad is polarity, right? It, it's the ether dividing into the positive and negative charges, the masculine and feminine. And so the paradox of like the division into two is that the opposite poles remember their source, they attract each other in an attempt to merge and to create unity. Um, however, there's something that's like long range attraction and short range repulsion. And so the, the ultimate, you know, when you put um, <clears throat> the two sides of a magnet together, there's this repulsion, right? So the, so the dyad simultaneously divides and unites attracts and repels, separates from unity and craves to return to it. Oh, kind of an interesting thing, that the duality. And the ether um, spins itself into plasma, into through that torsion motion of a spiral, we get this separation of charge. Uh, it takes two to tango, only by acknowledging both poles in the pair as inseparable can we overcome the relative duality and get to their common source in the monad as in our deepest self we're beyond polarity right i really find this in the crown center um, that the crown center is beyond this duality or polarity the crown center really exists in the monad or the one 
Uh, the monad and the dyad are considered to be the parents of the numbers, so mom and dad. Uh, hydrogen, so the, the sort of most primary atom that is the building block for life itself has a positively charged proton and a negatively charged electron. So that is hydrogen is a representation of the, of the two, positive and negative. Uh, the triad or the triangle, so it's the firstborn. Triangle is the first shape to emerge from the vesica Pisces. And um, the three, this is a really, three is a really important number. When I read the chapter on the number three <clears throat> in the book, The Beginner's Guide to Constructing the Universe, it was probably the most profound chapter in any book I've ever read. Um, and this understanding of the three and, and the nature of the three has really impacted my philosophy, the way that I approached things, the importance of triangulation. Um, so it's really natural to divide a whole into three parts, the beginning, the middle, or the end. Tr Trinity, the triunity, three as one. Um, the preeminent symbol of divinity, right? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of places in different uh, religions or spiritual traditions where this three shows up. And the opposites are balanced by a third mediating element. Uh, ancient mathematical philosophers referred to it as prudence, wisdom, piety, friendship, peace, harmony, uh, unanimity, and marriage. So that's a very lovely kind of balanced thing. So here are some examples of triads, a birth, growth, decay, creating, maintaining, destroying, right? And then we think about this as like, are you a creator or a maintainer? Uh, where do you fall in, in the triad? I'm very much a creator and not very much a maintainer. So, um, you know, it's my job to create things and find other people who are maintainers to maintain them. But if you're a maintainer, then you need to hook up with a creator who's creating things that you can maintain. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, um, these are bone cells. An osteoblast builds bone. An osteocyte kind of maintains bone. And an osteoclast breaks down bone when it's time for that to happen. Uh, we see it in the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government, which are supposed to balance each other out. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, light, energy, mass, spirit, soul, body. Um, and then in, in the world of the um, geometry, the sacred geometry, you have a compass, a straight edge, and um, paper and pencil. Those are how you compose things. So now I'm going to read this, but this is this is something that has really that like more than anything, for whatever reason, this idea, and maybe it's because I'm a Libra and I'm a bothist, that this appeals to me so much. So two forces can be like opposites without resolution, like lawyers without a judge, but introduce a properly chosen third factor, and it can do induce a relationship that unifies them and brings them to a whole new level. A minimum of three elements is required to weave into a whole. Think of a braid. The principle of the triad can teach us how to resolve conflict. No enduring resolution of any kind is possible without three aspects, two opposites and a neutral, binding, balancing, arbitrating presence. Knowing how to choose the third factor means the difference between a conflict's resolution and its perpetuation. The third element, which, if chosen properly, achieves a previously unknown level of balance and completion. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Triangulation, if you're struggling with duality, what is the third element that can be introduced that resolves that struggle, that resolves that imbalance, that balances it? And, and that's very often for me, the perspective of bothism. You know, is it possible that both are true, that both can be right and good and that we're not stuck in either or? Okay, come into the number four. So the square and cube, the three dimensional space. So coming into three dimensions is the next to emerge from the Vesk Pisces. 
And so the fourness or square is associated with earth, the four directions, the four winds, the four seasons, the four corners of the globe, four footed creatures are earth bound. Um, natural forms arise from the mating of pattern and matter. So the arising of these natural parent patterns into 3D where they can be clothed in the four states of matter. And the four states of matter are solid, liquid, gas, or plasma, earth, water, air, and fire. And we also know ether as well, which all of these precipitate from the ether. <laughs> so the ether can arrange itself into these basic geometrical wave patterns that were named after Plato, although we definitely have seen evidence that uh, these shapes were understood before Plato and in plenty of other uh, cultures. Um, and so they arrange themselves in what chaos theory calls fractal patterns, weaving a matrix in space, interconnecting atoms with the stars. And the scales of the platonic solid are different, but the ratios between them are still the same. So right there, those five building blocks, this is the, the elemental stuff. And it's the ether that contains the geometry that life builds itself upon, right? So, so things just don't come into being. When we see chemical bonds, those are all forming in geometric patterns. They're forming on the blueprint that exists in the ether. Okay, number five, the pentad. So this is the introduction of life itself. Pentagonal symmetry is the supreme symbol of life, universally appealing. It's also um, talks of the quintessence, the life force that infuses the four elements that they cannot create on their own. Uh, the idea of stardom conveys a deep-seated association with excellence and brilliance and power. So pentagons abound in the natural and plant kingdoms. We find them everywhere. Flowers of every edible fruit has five petals, right? Kind of showing that life force present. Seeds, holders of life itself, are often arranged in a star pattern in fruit. And if you look at leaves, flowers, fruits, you see the invisible energy web of the archetype made visible as a pattern of living cells. So the pentad holds the principles of the geometry of regeneration, regenerating within and without. The number six is also called the hexad. And uh, it's associated with structure, function, order, space, power, time. In situations regarding strength and stability, for example, hex nuts or um, honeycombs, right? The bees have mastered the tensile integrity that is supplied by the six-sided form. It's also related to the seal of Solomon or the shield of David or the mark of Vishnu. Um, Right, beehives, a 1.5 ounces of wax in this hexagonal patterning can hold four pounds of honey, which is an amazing structural accomplishment. Uh, so this hexagonal tessellation, and that's what we see in the, in the honeycomb, that's tessellation when these forms stack up like that, uh, that they recur endlessly. And so our lungs, our muscles in our eye, and like we, our body is composed of this sort of hexagonal shape, shaping. Um, we see it in snowflakes and quartz, so the order of quartz. Um, even though we're going one to 10, the number 12 is an important number as well. The uh, dodecagon, the framework number. It's used in teepees and lodges and Native Americans and other societal structures. Um, it's the sunlight, the sun king, right? This whole idea that Jesus was surrounded by 12 uh, uh, apostles, that King Arthur had the 12 knights of the round table. So we see this sort of 12 around one symbology in many, many places. 12 constellations of the zodiac, 12 step programs, 12 disciples, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 notes in our chromatic musical scale. Right? So this 12 around one, it really exists in our deepest psyche. And actually in the biofield, I've come to see that our electrical system, our biofield actually has 12 bands. 
that are comprised of 12 strands each for the 144 strands of light that flow through our toroidal electrical system. Um, so that 12 around one is actually a representation of our experience within our biofield and those have also been associated with the 12 meridians. The 12 meridians around one central channel. So that kind of just all really fits in. Um, and then 12 times 12 is 144, which as you might know, you know, we have 144 hertz weighted and unweighted forks. And really of all the forks I've ever used, the both the weighted and unweighted 144 hertz are truly the most effective at really reflecting where there is instability in the system or where a system is out of integrity and helping to guide it back into that integrity. So. Um, just a very important concept uh, to understand the nature of the 12. So the number seven is a, a heptad or heptagon, and it cannot be born through the, the vesica Pisces. It cannot be constructed by the compass or straight edge and pencil accurately. It's very, very difficult uh, to create a seven-sided form. It can't be divided and it can't produce other numbers which is why it's considered a virgin or a holy number. So I bet you didn't know that. Nature does not produce heptagons. Nothing in the mineral world is seven-sided, okay? But at the same time, it creates a, um, a familiar rhythm, right? So we've got seven days in the week, seven notes in the um, musical scale, right? The major ma musical scale seven years till every cell in your body is replaced. Even your, um, your credit report <laughs> kind of lives for seven years and then falls off, which I think is really interesting. Temples to Athena were designed and constructed around the number seven. And certainly we work with the seven chakras, um, which is the colors in the rainbow, right? Um, we have seven sets of endocrine glands. So. Seven's an, it's an interesting number in the way that it shows up. And so this is just how it shows up in music. So we get the seven notes plus the five sharps flats, right? So the seven and five makes 12. The musical scale was designed to play the harmonies of the heaven, the music of the spheres, allowing higher principles to enter our lives through our sense of hearing and emotion. Music was seen as having great power for producing heaven on earth, right? I mean, I feel like a lot of the contemporary music that's being produced is not creating heaven on earth. Um, it's creating noise. In fact, there's a helicopter going by right now as I'm speaking this, and I, I feel like our current musical system has that uh, kind of interference in it because we use this tempered musical scale and the shifting of tuning from 432A, which is more of a natural number that plays in with all of these other numbers in sacred geometry, to 440, which is kind of an unstable frequency. So um, let's see, we are the seven stringed lyre of Apollo, whose music is heard by both God and humans, right? Oh, we are instruments. And, and with our seven energy centers, they're just different parts of us that interact, our strings get plucked by life itself. Um, 12 has numbers with all the relations in the decad, whereas seven has none. It's kind of an interesting thing when you look at the numbers relationally. Hidden, unborn, eternally elusive side of 12, but they are often together. 12 meridians, meridians and seven chakras, right? And I've also discovered that there's half steps in our own system uh, between our chakras. So we end up with the 12 notes if you include those half steps in between, right? <clears throat> the seven chakras, the seven, the seven endocrine glands, the seven notes on the lyre. But, uh, you know, it's a really kind of an interesting pattern there. Okay, eight is the octad. An octave brings you back to the beginning. Uh, chess is a board that's eight by eight. The I Ching is eight by eight. Uh, certainly in China, though, there's a real respect for the number eight, and people like to get married on eight, eight. Um, it represents peace and stability and also abundance. Um, and it's also been related to the moon. So it displays wholeness, cycles, polarity, and manifestation as the doubling of four. 
Um, mitosis is an eight-step process, and one becomes a two, becomes a four, becomes an eight, and how cells divide. The number nine, the Ennead, so three times three times three, it's the trinity showing up here. It's the ultimate expression of something. So it's like you go the whole nine yards, you go all the way, or you're dressed to the nines. Nine innings in baseball, nine months in gestation, nine justices in the Supreme Court. It's sort of the boundary between the mundane and the infinite. And just like three is a very intriguing number, and then six doubles to the 12, uh, nine is also, uh, shows up over and over and over again when you start diving into number magic. It's just, that nine shows up everywhere. Uh, in fact, in the Solfeggio set of tuning forks, every single one of those, if you add the digits of like 174 or 417, um, they will all add up to a three, six, or nine. So the Fibonacci sequence is based in this sort of magic of three, six, and nine. 10, the decad, uh, all encompassing perfection, completion of a journey and a return to the origin, a journey into limitlessness. Right? So a decagon is a 10 sided shape. It's a portrait of a whole family of numbers gathered together. I don't know what it is about that particular line, but it, it's moving to me for some reason, like brings tears to my eyes, like the whole family of numbers all together. <laughs> um, it comprehends and it harmonizes all the numbers below it. It's generative power into the infinite and it's fulfillment and new beginnings. It's kind of like the end of a cycle and the beginning of a new one. Okay, so that was kind of an interesting journey with the numbers and I hope that that was sort of helpful and eye-opening to you. Um, when I really dove deep into my training with this, I was really struck by how it should be taught in schools. And I worked with my own kids to, to teach them this, and I feel like it was so enriching to them. Um, sacred geometry should be taught for a number of reasons. It raises important awareness of interconnectedness, which I think is so, so important. It offers students a cosmology of connection and relationship as opposed to separation because our current cosmology is very, very separate. Everything is separate. <laughs> um, it engages both hemispheres of the brain. Children can approach it logically or intuitively according to their natural strengths. And at the same time, they will develop and strengthen in the ways that they are less naturally inclined. That's brilliant, right? That's a really brilliant teaching tool. So, these patterns, you know, as we are starting to understand them here together, can easily be taught and shared with children. And in doing so, we foster in them an awareness of the underlying patterns and harmony inherent in the natural environment. And I think this is a key component in creating a more balanced and harmonious future because this understanding will inform our built environment, it will inform architecture, it will inform really anything that people create because they will be working with these fundamental patterns, which immediately brings them into harmony with the natural world. Um, so there's lots of different instruction out there if you want to play. I get a compass and a ruler and some paper and you can figure out how to um, how to draw, how to participate in this. Um, there, you know, there's, there's plenty of other ways too. I'm sure on YouTube, you can find all kinds of little sacred geometry, hands-on classes where you can do this. And I would really strongly recommend it. Um, I definitely find that this is so enriching, right? And you, another way that you can play and get to know and get to familiarize yourself with this is we have our Fibonacci pair of tuning forks. So 89 and 144 are the 11th and 12th positions in the Fibonacci sequence. And the forks create a binaural beat of phi, of that golden mean, of that golden ratio. And it gives your etheric template the geometric information to order itself against. And I especially find this with the 144 uh, unweighted fork, like it really demonstrates where things are out of integrity, where they're not in alignment with the underlying perfect pattern and really gives the body the information it needs to come back into that harmony. Uh, so these are resources you can take a look at if there is any of these things that you want to go 
and check out, please do. Um, I've read all of these so, so helpful, so enriching. It's such a satisfying rabbit hole to go into because, because it's so juicy and, um, and you just, you get, you just get so much out of it. You get so much out of it. And so I would absolutely encourage you uh, to learn more, to play, um, to surround yourself you know, with the shapes. And I've got a dodecahedron here. Just having the shapes around um, gives that information to your body. And um, and it's pleasing, you know, the, it's very stress-free to contemplate the platonic solids, things that are really basic like this. So there you go. That's your class on sacred geometry. I hope you found it helpful. If you have any questions when you get through this, please feel free to send them to us. At some point, I'll hop on live somewhere and I'll do a, a Q&A and be able to answer your questions. All right, everybody, enjoy. Stay balanced and in harmony. Take care.